Here, let's call the um, Wednesday, January 29th, 2014 meeting of the Planning and Transportation Commission to order and have Secretary Elner please call the roll. Commissioner Alchek. Vice Chair Keller. Present. Commissioner King. Present. Commissioner Martinez. Chair Michael. Present. Commissioner Tanaka. Present. Five present. So before we get down to business, um, we only have five commissioners here this evening. Um, um, Commissioner uh, Pinelli has submitted a resignation and so there will be a vacancy on the commission and we'll operate with six commissioners uh, until that's filled. And I wanted to express uh, appreciation uh, from me personally and from the commission to Commissioner, former Commissioner Pinelli for his service. Uh, he had previously served in the Parks and, Rec Parks and Recreation Commission and along with Commissioner Tanaka and myself on the IBRIC. And he um, was very energetic, uh, thoughtful, uh, and uh, was a valuable member of the commission. And um, we're sorry that uh, he is unable to continue serving. Um, and uh, with that, we've rearranged our seating and moved Commissioner King uh, over to our, uh, to our right, uh, so to maintain symmetry. And uh, on that basis, uh, uh, let's open the meeting. Uh, we don't have any um, speaker cards for oral communications. Uh, so we can move right into the agenda, beginning with uh, an informational item, informational item, which is the department work plan, uh, and which will be presented by Hillary Gittleman. And uh, I'd like to make a, a slight uh, agenda change. Uh, the director's report is often at the end of the meeting. And um, I'd like to, um, uh, Propose that Director Gittleman could give the director's report uh, in conjunction with the director's the, the department work plan. So please proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Michael. Commissioners, good evening. Uh, that's a great um, great idea because one will segue directly into the other. Um, we had a good conversation with the council on Monday about the residential permit parking idea, uh, and it was really the first of a handful of uh, really substantive policy questions and actions we're going to be bringing to the council in the next 60 days. And this is reflected as well in the work plan. Um, the council on Monday uh, directed us to do two things with regard to RPP. Uh, in addition to those two things, I think we're going to look for another, a better uh, name for this project. RPP is getting getting tired. Uh, but the two things they wanted us to do is draft an ordinance, uh, creating a citywide framework, which would include criteria and procedures for establishment of residential permit parking districts, uh, and uh, prepare that ordinance and disseminate it for public review. Uh, the second thing they asked us to do is to convene a stakeholder group and start working on the implementation aspects of the first district. I think everybody recognizes that we can't create districts all over the city all at once. So the idea is we will create an ordinance framework uh, for the whole city and then work on one district at a time. So they've asked us to do those two things concurrently and they gave us a very specific uh, time frame in which to deliver both of those things. Their hope is that the ordinance uh, and the implementation actions can get uh, through a, a public input discussion process, uh, gain a, a planning commission uh, recommendation and get back to council for action in November uh, so that the first district could be implemented in January of 2015. Um, so that was Monday's item. Now coming up on next Monday, uh, we again have some substantive conversations with the council um, on a couple different items. The first is an, the initiative we're calling Our Palo Alto. You may have heard about it. Uh, it's really an organizing principle um, that um, we, we're putting forward in an attempt to um, describe a, a renewed effort at community engagement and communication strategies to engage uh, members of the community in a whole variety of interesting ideas and issues over the course of the next year or two. Uh, in addition, um, the organizing principle uh, nests within it a number of 
specific actions to address near-term uh, issues. One of them, for example, is residential permit parking. Um, but there are a handful of other uh, really critical actions we're going to be bringing to the council. Um, then the, the third sort of uh, category under the our Palo Alto structure is uh, we're calling design, and that relates to the comprehensive plan. Um, so uh, we'll be discussing that with the, with the council next Monday and hopefully getting their direction or endorsement on this organizing principle uh, as well as some of its components. Uh, we'll be bringing concurrently one of the first action uh, pieces, which is our suggestion that uh, the city take a time out on uh, planned community zoning uh, requests uh, until reforms can be considered and enacted. And I know the commission has played a role in articulating what some of those reforms uh, might be. Uh, so the, both those things will go to the council next Monday. We also have a appeal of a sign uh, exception again. So we'll see if the council wants to relive that experience of a conversation about a sign exception. Um, then on February 10th, we plan to bring to the council a series of actions related to parking supply uh, and uh, we're hoping to queue up for them uh, almost a half a dozen um, specific actions that the council can take in the form of direction to staff to advance uh, increases in parking supply uh, in, in an effort to address the concerns on that issue. That would be followed on February 24th. Uh, with a series of actions related to transportation demand management. So these are strategies related to alternatives to the private automobile. Uh, again, a handful of strategies, very specific actions and direction that we're requesting from the council um, to uh, tee up a whole work program for the year uh, on those uh, on those issues. Uh, that's probably also the day that the uh, California Avenue Streetscape Project will get to the council for the award of, of the bid. Uh, the opening of the bids. So, um, or that's what is well. Anyway, that, that, that's when the contract actually will get to them. Um, and then on March third is when we're scheduled to go uh, to the council on the comprehensive plan and talk about the next steps there. Uh, in addition, we've uh, committed to get back to the council with a, a informational report just on following up on the RPP item and when we'll be able to. Um, um, deliver on some of the intermediate steps um, to get to the deadline that the council has articulated. So that'll be on March 3rd. So that's a whole ton of work uh, in the next 30 days or so. Uh, and as I say, I think it kind of sets the table for the rest of the year. And if I can transition into the, the work plan that we provided uh, to the commission, uh, this is really provided for your information. It's something that um, that I developed with the help of the staff and the managers within the department in response to a request from the city manager. Uh, I think he is asking departments to put together this kind of um, document to get a handle on just everything that we're trying to get done this year. Uh, it's obviously going to inform our request uh, when it comes to budget season. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you read through it carefully, you'll see that we're requesting a number of additional resources to try and accomplish all of the goals and priorities that we set forward forth in the, in the draft uh, work plan. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm not going to repeat or, or, or read through this. Uh, we, we identified a couple overarching goals, summarized the department's functional areas, um, and I should clarify um, that the department has historically been combined with what is now really a separate department, Development Services. So uh, including in the current budget year, the two are budgeted together, but in, next, in the next budget year, uh, there's going to be a split. So uh, I'm the director of the uh, Planning and Community Environment Department. There's another director over Development Services, and, and for the first time, the budget will start to reflect uh, that um, you know, that structure uh, next year. And that's why some of the staffing totals and the, the budget numbers we included in the work plan are, are really estimates because we're trying to uh, determine right now, looking at the, the whole budget for the combined uh, two departments, you know, which uh, ex revenues and expenses and staff fall on which side of the line. And that's why it's a little bit of, a, of an estimate. But. Um, uh, with that, you know, I, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. I, you know, I hope it was it was clear. Uh, I was ho hope it was also obvious that we have uh, just a ton of work to do this year, and we're looking forward to the commission's help on a lot of these uh, departmental priorities. Uh, will ultimately involve your 
uh, your input and recommendations from this commission to the council. Um, so thank you for that. I wonder if it would be um, appropriate for you just to very quickly run down some of the key departmental priorities, uh, not to go into them in any detail, but I think that this is a very useful list, um, certainly for us as a commission, and if anyone is in the audience or you know, listening in the public, I think it would be, they might not have access to this document, so perhaps you can shed some light on that. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. The, the um, departmental priorities for the year, again, subject to change based on budgeting and, and council and city manager direction, are in section three of the work plan. And it starts off with the housing element. Um, as the commission knows, we have a hard deadline to get the housing element updated again by January of 2015. So that's something at the top of our list. Um, number two on this list is the comprehensive plan update. Uh, commission's been working hard on that. I, th I think we are at the point where we're bringing to the, uh, the city council again on March 3rd a suggestion about how to take the process from here, you know, what happens next. So that's a priority. Um, parking supply and parking management. Uh, just talked about the fact that we are, are looking at RPP, which is parking management, but parking supply as well will go on to the council on February 10th with the number of actions to kind of set the table uh, for the rest of the year, things that we'll be working on throughout the year. Uh, transit and TDM programs, uh, same thing, a whole suite of actions um, we'll be bringing to council for direction on February 24th. Then bike plan implementation, um, the staff is working with uh, consultants on design and environmental review and community outreach related to 18 different projects to implement the city's bike plan this year and next year. So there's a huge workload on that, um, on that uh, issue, uh, as well as on transit, TDM, and parking. Um, then uh, we really want to start to do, the next priority is about uh, outreach data and analysis. We want to try and um, improve the availability and dissemination of data related to um, everyth everything around us. We're proposing in the context of the parking supply item, for example, uh, uh, we, we want the council to give us the authority to solicit bids for the installation of kind of equipment you need to monitor parking garage and parking lot occupancy on a real-time basis so that you know exactly where your empty parking spaces are and you can direct people there through their phones or through signs or whatever. Um, so we're trying to get uh, things like that in place uh, it, this year so that we can start to do it, just do a better job of um, making data available and using it where, where, where we can. Um, then the other priorities, just keeping going down the list, a uh, planned community zoning reform, uh, we just talked about that. Um, transportation planning, uh, again, we, you know, we do a lot and we just had a recently an item at the commission about how we conduct um, transportation analyses of specific development proposals. Um, the world is changing a little bit with regard to that as the state law was, the CEQA was amended this last year. Uh, and agencies will have to start weaning themselves off of the level of service calculations that we all use as a metric for traffic congestion. Uh, the state is really challenging everybody to start finding alternate metrics uh, that better reflect um, traffic conditions in urban areas. So we'll, we'll see what that looks like when it gets uh, on the ground sometime this year. Uh, other priorities, development center support. You know, we even though the two, depart the two departments functions are breaking into two departments, we still play a role in processing building permit applications through the development center and providing public information and answering questions at the development center. So they'll remain there remain a link between the two departments uh, and our obligation to support um, those efforts and get uh, the applications processed within the time frames that are established uh, for reviewers at the development center. Planning entitlements, obviously we continue to process applications that walk in our door for planning level entitlements. Um, the IR program uh, related to two-story single family homes, we continue to get a, a whole lot of applications every year that require um, processing. And then there's this kind of other category at the end that has some important things in it. Uh, not to suggest that any of those are not as important as some of the other priorities. They're just, you know, I could have gone on for another page if each of these things were listed, uh, listed individually. But things like um, the Cal Ave streetscape um, construction, uh, the 
direction that we've gotten from council to work on sidewalk widths on El Camino. I mean, all of these things turn into sizable work tasks for, for staff uh, and often involve the commission as well. So, uh, you know, there's a list there uh, in that last, uh, last category. Uh, anyway, that, that's it. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, so, uh, excellent. Thank you very much uh, for that. I know this is an informational item and you're not really seeking any f feedback or, or, or questions from the commission, but if anybody on the commission has a, uh, a question that they feel that they, they have to ask, um, uh, this is an opportunity. Um, okay. Um, so, um, I know one of the things that we discussed is at some point in um, probably the next month or two, we'd like to get on the, uh, the agenda of the PTC uh, a retreat. And one of the topics we might put on the agenda of the commission retreat would be um, a clarification of, of priorities at the commission level, which I suspect would largely track the priorities that you just outlined for the department. <clears throat> uh, and to the extent that there's policy direction or priorities of the council that we would also be cognizant of, of council priorities. Um, so I look forward to that discussion um, with our colleagues in the commission and, and participation from you and, and the staff. Um, the, uh, the opportunity for the commission to be um, not only responsive to the, the, the planning and transportation and related issues that come up with the community, but in some cases to be uh, proactive where appropriate. Uh, we'd like to make sure that we uh, are able to, to see what priorities and deliverables there might be in 2014 so that we can look back and have a sense of um, paying attention to what, what matters. Uh, Vice Chair Keller, do you have something you'd like to add here? Uh, yes. Uh, firstly, I think that this was an, you know, an excellent um, overview of what the um, Planning and Community Environment Department is going to be doing, and, and it's actually very helpful for us to have visibility into that, and, and to the extent that people in the public have gotten access to it, I think that's also useful. Um, so I just um, have uh, two questions, one you already touched on a little bit, which is in terms of current planning, how is that divide, going to be divided up between the development department uh, or development services department and planning and community environment? Maybe you can elucidate how, how that would happen in terms of a, a, a typical project that comes in the door, where, which goes where, you know, maybe briefly, not in too much detail. Well, in general, the Planning and Community Environment Department will be responsible for processing planning entitlements. You know, those are uh, things that go through the AARB, the Planning Commission, um, the IR program, uh, and in general, the Development Services uh, Department will be responsible for building permit processing. Um, there are public information functions that go with both departments, and that's a big part of where there's going to be crossover. You know, we're going to want planning staff to be accessible to answer planning questions at the development center. And every time there's a planning entitlement, a building permit follows. So there's a crosswalk that happens between, you know, on individual projects as well. So um, that's... Um, uh, that's part of the reason there's so much overlap. And, and we're right now working with our uh, administrative team to try and figure out in the budgeting process uh, whether there are whole bodies that are budgeted in one department versus another or whether there are bodies that are split between the two departments. And I think there will be a number of people who you know, physically sit in the planning department, but a portion of their work is budgeted to development services because they provide critical support to that department. I hope it will be easier to sl split staff than Solomon's baby. Uh, the second issue is, um, uh, you know, in terms of things like things like RPP, and I don't want to get into too much detail but of that, but I'm sort of wondering, in terms, you know, there, there's a discussion that you, uh, you had about Monday's meeting, and one of the, the things I'm wondering about is whether it will be on the table in terms of re addressing par parking demand, um, the idea of adjusting the development development amount, the throttling development to some extent based on, on um, the parking availability, or whether the only methods of reducing parking demand is by getting cars off the road. I, I, th I think the, uh, the comprehensive plan, you know, that you all have been working on, if we're successful in, in pitching this idea to the council that, um, you know, that we 
take what you've done as a foundation for a broader community conversation. I think that's one of the topics that we can engage in in that community conversation about um, the future of, of our city because, you know, the, the last uh, comp plan had the development cap for downtown and an overall cap for the city. It could be that, you know, those, uh, you know, are examined again to see if that's the best way to talk about um, the amount of development we foresee or if there are other ways to talk about those issues. So I, I see that conversation specifically happening in the, in the comprehensive plan um, process. So in some sense, figuring out what the carrying capacity is for Palo Alto and evaluating how that affects development, how that affects parking, how that affects traffic in that kind of conversation. I, you know, I'm not a fan of the term carrying capacity, but if you're talking about the amount and pace of, of development and change, I think that, that's correct. Okay, thank you. So once again, thank you very much, and, <clears throat> and good luck in 2014. I wonder when you, when you accepted this opportunity if you realized what fun you'd be having. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to say, I wonder when we get to the end of the year, if we look back and are going to be able to see how this has changed. And I'm, I'm sure it will change in the course of the year. Thank so you. we look forward to working with you. And, and uh, these, are, these are big issues. So as we move into the public hearing, um, there are two items um, that are um, potentially going to be continued. The item number two, which is the California Avenue concept plan, uh, we would, we've been requested to continue this to the meeting of February 12th. And also uh, item number four, uh, <coughs> related to 441 Page Mill Road, uh, which uh, is undergoing sort of additional staff review. There's a request that, that be continued to a date uncertain. Uh, so at this point, um, maybe I could get a motion from somebody and we will take a vote on continuing these two items. Uh, is there a second? So a motion by Commissioner King, seconded by uh, Commissioner Schnaka to continue the California Avenue concept plan to February 12th meeting of the commission and 441 Page Mill Road to be continued to a date uncertain. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So it's unanimous um, with Commissioner Martinez uh, absent and everyone else in favor. Um, so uh, moving to the item number three uh, on our agenda and the public hearing dealing with the business and economics element, um, let's begin with a report from staff. Thank you. Uh, and we're still, we don't have any uh, speaker cards from members of the public wishing to speak on this item. Um, so anybody who would like to speak on this or this item, um, please uh, fill out a card which uh, is available around the room. and. You can be heard. Great. Thank you, Chair Michael. I'm Stephen Turner, the Advanced Planning Manager for the Department of Planning and Community Environment. And we're happy to present the Commission with the draft business and economic element for your consideration. As the uh, Commission may know, this is an optional element within the comprehensive plan. Uh, the elements of land use, transportation, housing, natural environment and safety, and community services are all elements that satisfy the state requirements for general plans. But as it states in the existing business and economics element, the goals, policies, and programs of this element are equally important to those of the mandatory elements. And the importance of this element was really reflected in the work by the PTC subcommittee uh, that worked on this. This is represented by Chair Michael and Commissioners Martinez and Tanaka, as well as staff members, uh, Tommy, Thomas Fahrenbach, uh, our economic development manager, and planner Chitra Moitra, uh, who also provided a lot of work with on this element uh, as well. Um, before I get into some of the specifics of the element, I thought that Thomas could give a brief overview and some contextual information uh, about the element and about um, the economic and development uh, environment within Palo Alto uh, before we get into specifics. So with that, I'll give it over to Tommy. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Um, I am Thomas Fehrenbach. I'm the economic development manager for the city. And uh, we thought it'd just be um, a good exercise to give you just a brief uh, overview of the economic environment here in Palo Alto. Um, I have uh, probably about an hour presentation that I've truncated down to uh, four minutes. So. Um, uh, essentially, Palo Alto at a glance, we have uh, over 7,000 businesses um, and a daytime population uh, over 100,000. Um, it's a difficult thing to estimate here. 
Um, over 50% of our residents over 25 do have a master's or postdoctorate degrees, um, which is very high, I believe, uh, one of one of, if not the highest in in the nation, um, an average of two point three one people per household. Um, can you do you all get this right in front of you? Okay, so I, I won't need to uh, say all of these, but um, it is interesting to note that our um, unemployment is far below the county at three point two percent, and that there's been quite a bit of activity at our development center. Um, Palo Alto is a very uh, attractive place to live. It's an attractive place to work and to visit. And um, it's many different things that, that make up our attractiveness. We have some very strong assets in the community. Um, some that are sort of pictured here are, you know, clearly Stanford University, the Medical Center and the Research Park, um, the Venture Capital uh, and other, other types of funding available here, investment firms and such. We have very strong neighborhoods, uh, thriving retail and incubator centers. We have educated, engaged populace, business advocacy groups, real estate values are very high. Uh, we have world-class schools here. We own the suite of utilities, including fiber optics. Um, uh, obviously, the weather uh, is, is remarkable here, and especially noted uh, when uh, you come from the Midwest like I do. Uh, we also have a very uh, engaged art, arts and performance community, and um, you name the, the cause, and we have a very uh, strong nonprofit, most likely in our community, that ad addresses that cause. We have uh, a very impressive array of businesses in Palo Alto, from uh, mom and pop shops all the way up to Fortune 100 companies. Um, this slide right here, uh, I, I get to to kind of tout, especially when we get uh, visited, visited by all over the, the world from govern governments and other businesses. And it's a very impressive uh, array of, of businesses that we have here. Um, that said, uh, the focus of, of the Office of Economic Development is really twofold. It's, uh, it's in supporting and, and attempting to grow the revenue streams um, depicted here from our uh, adopted budget in 2014. Um, and these revenue streams that we focus on uh, really uh, uh, boil down to uh, about five, um, uh, five different streams that I'll go into later. But they pay for all of the, the services um, that the general fund, uh, that the general fund provides um, for this community. And uh, there, there is a nexus between uh, the businesses that are here in our community and our ability to provide uh, world-class service that uh, the city does provide. Um, uh, and I just wanted to go into the sort of, you know, the trends um, as depicted here in this slide um, of some of those revenue streams uh, for the past 10 years or so and looking forward uh, as we forecast. Um, the, the second real focus of my, uh, my office is to maintain the, um, the brand of Palo Alto, to foster innovation and the innovative spirit of this place where you can bring ideas, connect with the resources, and launch these ideas into amazing companies. But all of this needs to be done in a, in a, in, in a way that is consistent and balanced with the city's sustainability goals. Um, and, and our practices, and also consistent with the livability and residential quality of our community. Uh, and that, that really is set forth in the policy of economic development for Palo Alto, and it's something that um, makes my, my job and the, the work of economic development in Palo Alto very challenging, um, but also rewarding. And ultimately, it's, it's really what makes Palo Alto such a great place is that we, we attempt to balance the forces of amazing innovations in technology and business while also being a place where people want to live, want to raise a family, and want to visit. So with that, I will say that uh, this element uh, is a good foundation for us to meet the opportunities and challenges ahead in a manner that balances 
support for innovative companies, the needed funds for services, the city's brand, and the livable, sustainable, sustainable and residential qualities that make Palo Alto such a wonderful place. So thank you, and I'll turn it back to Mr. Turner. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, really, if I could almost distill um, Thomas's remarks into uh, language that I can put into the element, I think his comments would be perfect because I think uh, what he mentioned was really uh, our attempt to reflect um, those values uh, within the element itself and his participation within the subcommittee I think was very valuable in helping us kind of keep us on track on what is really important with regards to economic development um, and this in this particular element. Um, so uh, just to summarize really about this particular element and what it's trying to do, it, it highlights the city's legacy and strength as a technologically innovative city with two uh, dominating business centers being the downtown and California Avenue. And it also recognizes our city as a regional shopping center um, and an employment destination and acknowledges our individual neighborhood retail districts and illustrates ways of doing business within Palo Alto. And that's reflected throughout the goals, policies, and programs of, of the element. On page three of your staff report, um, it includes a table about the existing and proposed goal structure. The PTC subcommittee and staff uh, is recommending uh, a change to that structure. Uh, the existing structure is focused um, in uh, a number of different goals, including citywide compatibility, uh, diversity, growth, flexibility, and then a focus in, on our centers, our, our regional centers such as the downtown SOFA district and the shopping center, uh, our multi-neighborhood centers such as California Avenue and El Camino, um, as well as uh, our neighborhood centers um, and employment districts including the research park and the medical center and East Bay Shore areas. Um, the subcommittee felt um, that the goal structure and the goal language themselves could be restructured um, to really focus on the key elements um, of business and economics within Palo Alto. Uh, and so a lot of the ideas and concepts of the existing goal language have been moved over to the proposed goal language, but really organized in a little bit different way. Um, so if you noticed in the proposed column, um, we have goals that are focusing on the encouraging and, and innovation of technology, a focus on our, our two major business centers, the downtown and California Avenue. Again, identifying and recognizing that Palo Alto is a regional shopping and service and employment destination. And so um, areas such as the Stanford Shopping Center, the Research Park, East Bay Shore, and East Meadow Circle area are highlighted. Um, the fourth goal is focused on our thriving retail districts. Uh, and those are our uh, major retail districts on El Camino Real, uh, the south of Forest area and town and country village, uh, but also focusing on our neighborhood serving retail districts. Um, our midtown area, it should be listed as uh, Charleston Shopping Center rather than Plaza, Edgewood Plaza and Alma Village instead of Alma Plaza. Um, the element is wrapped up by focusing on ways of doing business in Palo Alto uh, and, and really balancing uh, the economic and development needs within the city with the residential character and, and feel um, that is so important to the city. And then filing up with a brand new goal regarding visitors and tourism. Um, we. Uh, recognize that uh, Palo Alto uh, is visited by groups from around the world um, and they want to see how Palo Alto works, what makes us special, uh, to see if they can try to bring those ideas back to their home regions. And, um, and so we felt it was important to identify Palo Alto as a, as a visitor and as a, really as a global destination. Um, the vision statement uh, also has been adjusted to really fit the format of the new goal structure. Um, the language is consistent with the themes and the format that the PTC has tried to apply to the other elements. Um, so the vision statement really tries to uh, distill to the essence of what we're trying to do with business and economics within Palo Alto. Um, you can read that within the staff report. Um, the um, PTC, along with the economic development manager, really, um, I think, took a look at the existing goals, policies, and programs 
um, and really tried to retain uh, the existing uh, flavor and intent of those policies and programs, but really focused the language more on outcome-based um, to really show things that could be perhaps measurable or things to specifically work towards. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of change was uh, the result of removing redundancies and improving clarity throughout the document. All in all, um, 33 new policies and 35 new programs have been added. Approximately 40 of those existing policies and programs were carried over from the existing element, um, either unchanged or just with minor edits. About 11 policies and programs were removed just because either they were completed or they were repetitive um, or they were no longer applicable uh, to, um, to what we we're trying to achieve within the element. Um, and then finally, we've had a number of community stakeholder groups really contribute very valuable input uh, to this process um, throughout the time that we've been reviewing it. Um, specifically, uh, Lucy Wicks and Tiffany Griego um, from Stanford University uh, providing their perspective uh, on the element. And then Hal Mickelson with the Palo Alto Chamber of Commerce really put uh, a lot of effort um, into providing uh, very specific comments and details. We've had a number of meetings with the chamber and they've always been uh, extremely helpful um, and uh, provided a lot of good assistance in preparing the draft that's in front of you tonight. So with that, that concludes the staff report and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. So before we get to questions from the commission, um, let's um, open up to um, the public. We just have one speaker card at the moment. If anybody else would like to, to speak um, um, on this, um, you can fill out a card there or in the back table and uh, we would be happy to recognize you as a speaker. Aaron? And through the chair, I'd like to, Aaron Ackman, Assistant Planning Director. I'd like to add one thing that was also in the written report. I know there's not a huge turnout tonight, but the the, public as well as the council and the commission are all going to get um, further chances to take a look at this element as well as well as the entire comp plan when it gets to the to the council level so there'll be additional opportunities so if you're a member of the public at home um, and you want to still provide comments on it there will be additional opportunities to do so agreed and so noted um, uh, our uh, first and currently only speaker, I guess we have one more coming up, um, is uh, Robert Moss. Um, and uh, you will have five minutes. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, thank you, Chair Michael and uh, commissioners. I wanted to get a sense from uh, the staff presentation of how they were putting this out. And I think the overall approach is nice and uh, it gives a good view of the city in, in general and uh, talking about emphasizing downtown and California avenues, our primary commercial areas are fine. But then uh, there's a few little bumps. And the one that concerns me is an El Camino. Uh, I don't think many of you remember this, but once upon a time, back in the 70s, we had an El Camino design program and I'm probably the only person left in town that worked on that committee. And we considered what El Camino should look like long term. And we were concerned primarily about uh, the area basically between Adobe Creek and Page Mill, which is the Ventura and, and Barron Park neighborhoods primarily. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but along Barron Park, almost all the lots along El Camino are only about 100 feet deep. So there's not room for an awful lot of construction. And in the discussion of the retail districts, on pages 10 and 11, we talk about El Camino. And I'm concerned when you start talking about increasing uh, density and I'm not sure what you mean by opportunities where a concentration of commercial services research, serving research park employees and visitors might be created. The original intent of the El Camino design guidelines was to make it attractive and functional for the people that live behind El Camino and Barron Park, Ventura, and the other neighborhoods. So what's the intent or the difference between serving the neighborhood because we're supposed to make El Camino a walkable neighborhood serving commercial site and serving the research park. I'm puzzled. Um, 
second, when you talk about supporting business vitality, one of the things that you have to be careful of is if you increase the potential development along El Camino, you're going to find the property owners evicting the current small businesses and going for larger commercial establishments or maybe all housing because that's where the money is nowadays and we'll lose our walkable shopping. So these things have to be balanced and thought of very carefully. One of the problems that I've seen over the years is that when a development comes in, and it's not limited just to El Camino, this is quite common in Palo Alto, you look at just that one project on that one site. You don't take into account the overall area you don't take into account what might happen if, for example, and this has happened, a uh, building is sold, the new owner doubles the rent, and stores which, saw, which served local residents are forced out and end up in Menlo Park or Mountain View or Redwood City. And this has actually happened to some of our businesses. So, uh, now, you can't do anything about change of ownership of property and what you can't regulate the rents, but when you make it, when you do things with the design and the density that make it more attractive for somebody to buy a property and jack up the price and increase what's built there, it hurts the entire community. So I'm just saying, go back and look at this again Look at what you're considering in not just El Camino, but Charleston Plaza, Edgewood Plaza, the other shopping areas, and see how it affects the entire area and how it might interact with other areas. Because one of the things that I find missing is what I've done for decades is called systems engineering, where you look at the impacts and see how they might accumulate and, and have effects that you really hadn't considered when you look at something that seems fairly simple. So I'm just saying, take another look at this and consider what the other impacts might be if you have too much rather than just stepping back and waiting and seeing what might happen over a longer period. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Moss. I know that the staff was taking notes while you're speaking. Um, is there anything um, that uh, Mr. Moss uh, mentioned that you wanted to respond to at this time or just wanted to take under advisement? Well, I think uh, Mr. Moss's uh, comments um, are valid. Um, certainly, we want to make sure that um, as development proceeds, um, that it's done so in a, in a manner that's consistent with our policies and programs. Um, you know, what we're doing with um, a lot of the policies within this particular document is really um, setting opportunities for exploring uh, options um, that might be able to be implemented, say, along El Camino Real, rather than specifically stating um, development potentials or regulations or, or specific requirements for development within the document. Um, we, this is really a policy document. It's not meant to be a, a solutions document or really describe all of the impacts that may result from these policies. Those impacts would be analyzed uh, as an individual development would come through and come forward through the environmental review process. But uh, at least um, the policies are in, would be in the comprehensive plan that would allow staff to at least explore um, the options and the possibilities and the impacts of changes along El Camino Real in a manner that's consistent with the language within the element. Uh, the next and currently final speaker is Tom Dubois, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. It's Tom Dubois, it's been Americanized. But, uh, I'll keep it very short. I have just two two points. So the first point is I'd like to encourage you to get community input, um, if at all possible, before it goes to city council. And maybe you can be part of um, Hillary's new um, outreach uh, program, Our Palo Alto. Um, it sounds like you've had some feedback from the Chamber of Commerce, and it'd be great to get start to get some feedback from residents. I know this has been under development for a long time but things tend to solidify at the point they go to city council. So I think that'd be good. Um, the second point is um, 
I saw a couple things in there about um, kind of preventing loss of space for retail and encouraging vacant buildings to be used for commercial use. And it's really about consistency. And, we're, <clears throat> and I think we're going to run into a conflict with the housing element. And we're going to have a lot of um, need to create housing. And so just um, that, that kind of conflict, particularly about using vacant lots or abandoned buildings, uh, those might be more suitable for housing than commercial. Thanks. So thank you very much. Uh, good, good comments. Uh, let's bring it back to the commission now and, and uh, have a round of um, comments or questions. Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, Commissioner Alcheck. Okay. Um, I'm sure that after I speak, maybe some of you will respond um, to what I'm saying, but and others will have m more general comments. But I wanted to uh, put forward <clears throat> an idea um, for this element that I. Um, I hope maybe we can add um, in an effort to get our council to think about it. And what I'm specifically talking about is the retail corridor of Cal Ave. We've had a lot of conversations about the vision for California Ave. And I support these um, significant growth um, ideas. And I think that one of the fears that a lot of our local shop owners and um, local shop customers have is that that growth, that development that I support will result in the arrival of chains that would drive up the rents through the competition. And one idea that I think should be included in this element so that the council may discuss it or at least create a debate would be the notion that we take a very strong position against chain stores in the California Avenue area. I would argue that that sort of uh, 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 <clears throat> that sort of position should be taken in a bulk of our city. But I think uh, I will pursue this idea on Cal Avenue alone as an effort to sort of create a, um, a test area. The city of San Francisco does this with, I think, great success. If you walk down the mission, some people describe the mission as a wildlife sanctuary of retail. You won't find um, um, chain stores there and formulaic um, retail outlets in the mission to a great extent. And I think that the independent boutiques and the bars and the restaurants down there, which are thriving at this point, are delicious, they're exciting, and they're the sort of things that we would, um, I think we'd all welcome here. Um, just so that you don't reinvent the wheel, the city of San Francisco defines a business with seven, 11 stores nationwide as a chain. Um, and also it defines stores that have certain standardized aesthetics and merchandise as a chain. I think we could develop a goal or programs in this element that could put um, the foundation towards potentially code, code changes that could protect Cal Avenue from Best Buy. As you consider this idea, I want you to think of the development on Santan San Antonio Road in El Camino and the development of Santana Row. I'm sorry to say this because I really welcome the mixed use that has come at San Antonio and El Camino, but there is nothing particularly unique, interesting, charming about Jared the jeweler, which has taken up a big space there, especially when you compare it to Glime Jewelers, our little local shop here. Um, it's going to end up being a mixed-use development with very generic and uh, and uh, and un and 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 and, 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 a, and a lack of charm. Santana Row is essentially Stanford Mall 
except a high end with a Best Buy and a Target. I don't think we need any Best Buys and Targets on Cal Avenue or anywhere in Palo Alto for that matter. We can drive across the 101 or down to San Antonio. So I, I think this notion that the rents will go up and everybody will move out is valid if, if, there's, if there's competition. But if we eliminate this, um, this chain store opportunity, you, you know, local stores, unlike chains, can't spread overhead across many stores. So they can't pay the same, a local store can't pay the same elevated rent and startup cost than a chain can. So if you take the chain out of competition, now you're talking about local stores competing with local stores. And in that regard, may the best store win. I don't think anybody could argue against that. Any, anybody who's, who fears this notion of high rents as a result of investment in the community. So what, what I'm suggesting here is that we focus on the Cal Avenue area specifically and its retail component and come up with some policies regarding the prohibition of chain stores in an effort to further this notion of developing that area and investing in that area, um, but not at the same time encouraging the destruction of our local stores. And I, I just, if I can have 30 more seconds, I just want to read to you guys this quote. Um, it's called The Death and, it's from the, the book The Death and Life of Great American Cities, written by Jane Jacobs. And she says the following. Um, for, for Jacobs, what constitutes community is not any one particular thing, but rather the, the many small interactions that occur in our everyday lives. It grows, she writes, out of people stopping by the bar for a beer, getting advice from the grocer, and giving advice to the newsstand man, comparing opinions with other consumers and customers at the bakery, and nodding hello to two boys drinking soda on a stoop, hearing about a job from a hardware man, and borrowing a dollar from the pharmacist. I think the idea here is that if we encourage this sort of local store um, protectionism, we can enhance the uniqueness of our neighborhoods and our retail um, so that we don't turn into a Santana Row or the San Antonio area. So thank you, Commissioner Alchek. Um, we just had um, a member of the public submit a um, speaker card. It's not clear, are you wanting to speak on the business and economics element or on? I'd actually like to address Mr. Alchek's comments. Uh, Okay. okay. Uh, give you uh, give you three minutes um, and well, um, or five minutes. And it's Bob Grossman. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I'll take that long. It's the first time I've been in one of these meetings. Thanks. Um, I'm a local retailer. I've been in Palo Alto for ten years in a single store, and a lot of what Mr. Alchek resonates very strongly with me. Um, uh, I'm in the Palo Alto Center where Sobrato brought the building, and I think. Um, local retailers are important to the community and I think the competition though is not just from big box it's from R&D as well as offices are coming in and taking up local retail spaces and as technology companies are coming in that's taking away available space for competition and rents um, you know my rent is looking at quadrupling I've been there for 10 years there's no place we can look in Palo Alto and find reasonably priced retail rents because the competition, they turn the space into office space. So I, I would agree, Mr. Alchek, it's important to keep local retailers in the community, but there needs to be something done to be able to provide protection for us, um, not just against big box, but against other sectors of potential rent competition. Thank you. So. I appreciate that comment. Thank and you. just to be clear, I'm suggesting like this notion of uh, local retail protectionism along with, for example, ground for retail, you know, requirements. So, uh, 
Um, so I know Commissioner Tanaka served uh, with me and Commissioner Martinez on the subcommittee dealing with the business and economic element. Would you like to um, add any questions or comments on the uh, draft? Sure. So, um, so first of all, it was um, actually quite exciting to uh, be on this subcommittee. It's something which I, I actually feel very passionate about. And um, so this actually already incorporates a lot of my thoughts, but I wanted to thank staff and my fellow commissioners for helping to, to update this. And so I don't have any particular edits to the documents, mainly because I've been part of the process already. But I will respond to uh, Commissioner Alchek's proposal. So in terms of ground floor um, retail, I am a huge fan of that. I think that's very important. I think you want to, um, you want to activate these areas. And when you have um, you know, long stretches of, of non-retail, it, um, it kind of uh, blocks uh, that, that, that energy in, in, in the city. So I think that's, that's actually very important. I think we have some things moving along in that area, but um, maybe that's something that we should capture more strongly in this. So I think, I think that's a great idea. Um, in the other proposal about um, having no chains, um, for me, I, I think about it in terms of like, what is the greatest good? So I, I, think, um, I think what's important is we want to be able to um, support innovative new type of retail uses. I think that's, that's actually a really good thing. Um, I was talking to a friend recently and, and, and uh, his wife started a uh, retail that resells used baby clothes. You know, kind of interesting, right? It seems to be taking off. And um, so I think encouraging these kind of new concepts is a, is a great thing. And I think we should have incentives for that. But in the end, I, I think about what is the greatest good. And so I think in my mind, the greatest good is around not just the um, uh, it's not just for the retailer themselves, but also for the community. And I think you know the space is valuable. Retail space is especially scarce. I think in Palo Alto. And uh, while well, I think there should be good incentives for encouraging these new retail concepts, especially ones that are starting out. Um, but sometimes the best. Um, the greatest good is actually a chain, right? I mean, Calav already has a Starbucks. Um, and so I, I think um, just because it's a chain doesn't mean it's bad. I mean, sometimes it actually provides um, value to, uh, to the community. So um, I don't necessarily support banning chains. Uh, I, do want, I do think we should, however, support um, these new kind of concepts and allow kind of the the mark forces to let the, the one that is most viable thrive. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner King. Uh, let's see. Um, so uh, um, I totally, <clears throat> and I get, again, I guess we're sort of by way of addressing Commissioner Alchek's comments, addressing the uh, plan. <clears throat> I, uh, totally value the local merchants. I was saddened today. Many of you may have heard that Cho's, a three decades institution, is, um, you know, has been given notice on California Avenue, you know, pot sticker man who's there working every day for six days a week for years. Um, and, uh, you know, the loss of JGNF, you know, maybe they come back, but it's really a different owner. That place, I, you know, the people there taught me about produce, how to pick produce, how to uh, you know, they taught me about meat, things that you just would not get from Safeway. You know, you're not going to find somebody that's that knowledgeable and helpful. So, <clears throat> totally value that. Um, as far as, and, and I fully believe that by maintaining zoning and making sure that office spaces do not crowd out retail, that that's certainly viable and valid. Um, as far as protecting against or keeping chains out, I think it's challenging in that, in general, I believe the consumers are really the ones who should do the choosing. And so you see there's a subway, there are many small, you know, there's Izzy's, small uh, outlets on California Avenue. Uh, then there's a subway. They both do great business. I suspect subway, I don't generally go there, but I suspect their sandwiches are a buck or two less than maybe a local chain. And so I think it will be I'm interested to investigate more about how San Francisco is doing it and what the impacts are, but I think it's very hard for us to be the arbiters of what people should have accessible to them in shopping. Um, one of the problems we'll have is that the, the costs 
to develop, for instance, that building where they're going to remodel, where chose is now. Uh, one of the challenges is if we believe that it's a good thing that the city should be rejuvenated and that old buildings should be improved and remodeled, then that is going to dictate that they have to get higher rents than they have now. So uh, anyway, I don't have an answer. I'm, I'm a little concerned on trying to override market forces and, and reduce the um, power of the consumer to choose what outlets we have in town. Uh, and then the other thing, which is a completely general question, but I am curious uh, as far as the business element, part of that is uh, ensuring revenues over the long term to pay the bills for the city. Uh, Atherton, I don't know if they have zero commercial. I, I think it's either it's either zero or close. And so they raise funds for the city by way of a parcel tax. Uh, I'm curious, is anybody familiar with any municipalities who have a hybrid model where they say, in this, as I'm looking forward, I see, you know, you hear a hue and cry that, wow, we really don't need a lot more development. We don't want more stuff in Palo Alto. Uh, I'm curious if anyone if any city has said, okay, well, we've got enough stuff, this generates X amount of revenue, we need more than that, we want to go to the people and see if they're willing to write a check every, every parcel every year for, I, I think Atherton's $500 a year. Is, does anybody know that? It's about that per parcel. Anybody have any familiarity with that? Uh, thank you, Commissioner King. Offhand, I, I do not have any familiarity of the cities. I mean, there's always, dependent upon the way you raise their money, the way you raise money, there's different limits and rules in the way that you can use that money. Um, so it always complicates things. And I, I think the thing that we learn the most over, you know, going through booms and, and recessions is the most diversified tax base that you have, the best that your city pulls through it. So, you know, to the extent that we have a good residential tax base, a good commercial tax base, good hotel tax base, I think is the best balanced approach to go for. Okay, thank you. I wasn't proposing we go that route. I was just curious if, if uh, down the road that was a possibility. Um, and then just lastly, can, you con can we confirm what we're, uh, so I'm seeing the recommendation is um, to review and comment on the draft and support their inclusion in the comp plan update. And so if we, are, are we looking for an actual motion tonight to do exactly that? Correct. Correct, and this will be the basically the planning commission recommended recommended version that will be used as the basis for what staff is recommending additional public out uh, additional public and council input at the council level. And okay. if you'd like to make a motion, we could. Okay, and, and so just to confirm, so we're basically moving this along, but then there will be additional public input prior to it going to correct council. But it no, will likely well, not not prior to going. There, there may be, it'll go to a council. We're going to discuss with the council what additional public, what the additional public input process should be. So it'll either be at the council level or uh, separate, from, separate from the council and individual community meetings, which is the route that staff is going to be recommending. Okay. But in any event, there will be additional period Correct. of public comment. And then it will, will not or might come back to uh, Planning and Transportation Commission. That's a good question. I, I don't, I don't, at this point, um, I don't see ha having another, you know, formal process uh, going back to the planning commission. Um, I think it, it's going to end up being what the community process is going to be once it gets to the council level that's going to decide that. Okay. So it's either will not or might. Okay. Yeah, and then the final comp plan as a whole will go back to, to the commission, but not on an, on an uh, individual element by element basis. Got it. Okay, thanks. Okay, then I so move that uh, we um, follow staff's recommendation uh, to support the inclusion uh, of, in the comprehensive plan update. Is there a second? Uh, seconded by Commissioner Tanaka. Um, Vice Chair Keller, would you like to uh, ask your questions or comments? Um, thank you. Um, so um, the first thing is that I am um, completely in support of Commissioner Alchek's suggestion. Um, I think it actually can be strengthened. First of all, I, I, I think that we should have no net loss of current retail. And, and um, in particular, the, uh, the, the, the ground floor retail is not being enforced adequately. Uh, Didims was kicked out. It was supposed to be replaced by retail. As far as I'm concerned, those two, uh, those two locations don't have retail. 
there was retail originally uh, across the street from that, which was replaced by uh, um, uh, Ways, which is not a retail location. So I'm, I'm, there's, there's certainly encroachment on that, and that affects, and I, I think that that needs to be enforced. But also, I think we need to think a little bit more about the retail mix. And part of the problem is when there's investment in a restaurant, restaurants stay there. So I think that the issue is that there should be, in some sense, a cap on how many restaurants there are per block, so that you have, not, have a mix of restaurant and other retail. And I think there should also be a cap, particularly in California Avenue, on how many nail salons and hair salons there are per block, because although some, degree, some amount is useful, uh, the issue is that nail, nail and hair, hair salons tend not to create thriving retail mix. So I think these are all part of the mix that need to be considered. Um, and also in terms of restaurants downtown, we want a mix of retail and restaurants, not just all restaurants, which is essentially what's happened to, to, um, to Castro Street and Mountain View. It's basically a uh, six or five or six block stretch of 90% restaurants. And, and that's not really a thriving uh, retail district either. Um, so a high level comment is that uh, is, is, in, is uh, illustrated by uh, one omission from the, the old vision that's not in the new vision. And the old vision says neighborhoods are protected. And I noticed that mentions of residents and the residents' input into the process and things like that are not really captured. The residents have been in many ways edited out of the business and economics element, which I think is unfortunate. Um, I think that, that basically considerations of the, of the needs of the citizens of Palo Alto, the residents of Palo Alto, need to be higher up in priority in terms of the business economics element and in terms of serving the needs of the residences in terms of where they want to shop and what they want to buy um, and also in terms of uh, not adversely impacting um, the residents based on what's going on in uh, the commercial development. So I think that, that needs to be put back. Um, I don't know where this idea of live work keeps on coming back. Um, we have three live work units. They're on El Camino Real. They're located between um, uh, California, sorry, between Stanford Avenue and Park Boulevard. Um, I challenge anyone in the city to tell me anybody, give me the name of anyone who has ever lived in either of the three of these. They've always been office space or um, without li anybody resident residing there, perhaps maybe uh, living, uh, sleeping overnight in terms of startups or retail. So live work doesn't seem to work in Palo Alto. Maybe it works in lofts in San Francisco. But I, I think I think it's a it's a it's a dead it's a it's an idea that is that doesn't work here, and so I would propose deleting one B one point two point one and B two point eleven point one. Um, I think there should be consideration of city facilities on California Avenue uh, as a way of in, as a way of promoting the uh, near California Avenue as a way of promoting uh, the retail uh, vitality of California Avenue. I think that would be an interesting thing to think about. Uh, in terms of B4.11, which refers to town and country, I think it should say at and near town and country. Circulation is an issue not only for town and country, but the surrounding area. Um, in terms of B6.6, which talks about hotels, we should also consider the business district. Hotels serving, this particular hotel serving the Stanford Research Park. I think there's inadequate hotels serving that. I think that would be a great thing. Uh, uh, when Before they were thinking of putting the uh, uh, the uh, soccer fields over there, or whatever the playing fields over there. Uh, one of the developers said that that was the best place between San Francisco and San Jose for putting a hotel. So instead, we have a bunch of kids running around, absorbing through their lungs at high velocity, high volumes, air polluted by one of the worst traffic intersections in our city. Now, I know we need playing fields, but I'm not sure that's the best place for them. What can I say? Um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, the delete elements, I understand and I, and I, I trust that, the, um, that in terms of the delete, el that, that, that uh, in terms of uh, the uh, delete elements, I think that that is useful to have as part of the staff report a list of those things that were deleted. There's things, the old things that were changed and modified, but it's not a list of delete elements so that there can be a check by others to see whether there's anything in there that would have been uh, useful 
um, that might not have been captured anymore. And, and, and I, see the, I see the numbers of the deleted elements, but I don't see the text of those deleted elements. And I think that, that that should be in the next version of the staff report. Thank you. So uh, Commissioner Martinez uh, can't be with us tonight. Uh, he worked on the subcommittee um, and had a lot of input to the, uh, to the draft. Um, I also had an opportunity to work on the subcommittee with uh, Eduardo and with uh, Commissioner Tanaka. And just for public understanding, I want to reflect on the, um, I think the, um, the degree of collaboration with the staff uh, uh, and uh, Thomas Fehrenbach and his, his, his efforts. Uh, what we did is we began with uh, trying to take, uh, if possible, uh, a fresh look based on what the conditions are today on the economy. There have been a lot of changes in the economy, both locally and nationally, since 1998. And so the vision statement uh, went through a number of uh, different proposed uh, language changes and a lot of discussion. Uh, it may not be perfect, but we felt that it captured the, the essence and the, the key points of what would be important for the city um, going forward. Um, likewise, we looked at the, the, the structure of the goals, and we thought that it was important to move uh, to the forefront the notion that Palo Alto is, is aligned with uh, innovation and technology entrepreneurship. This is a key part of the um, what's important in Palo Alto. That's not to overlook the neighborhood serving retail, which comes up, uh, you know, in the subsequent B2 and, and B3. Uh, and there's a balance of, of business and economic interest. It's not just uh, mom and pop. It's not just companies that are startups or become big companies, um, but it's all of the above. So the, um, the goal structure was intended to make sure that we had a, um, um, a valid overview of all of the pieces of the puzzle that make um, the uh, economy of Palo Alto viable and uh, potentially thriving going to the future. Um, uh, thriving was the uh, key aspect of the retail districts in goal four. Uh, and then there was some notion in goal B5 of being um, uh, practical. Uh, the outreach to the business community, the Chamber of Commerce, had, this, uh, had a lot of uh, back and forth relative to what it took to do business in Palo Alto, uh, you know, how does the city help or hinder, uh, what conditions should be um, you know, fine-tuned to make this serve the best interests of all the stakeholders. And then finally, we had the goal related to um, uh, uh, tourism um, and, and visitors, which is a, which is a key part of um, you know, people from all around the world wanting to come and, and visit with not only a great livable city, but a great visitable city. Um, so uh, it was with uh, sort of good faith that we entered into all these discussions. We're looking forward to uh, turning this over to the council. And I'm sure council is looking forward to opening it up to a discussion with the public. Uh, and when that discussion with the public uh, unfolds, uh, that it should be an opportunity to get significant improvement from the collective wisdom of, of, the, uh, of the residents, uh, the business people, and, and so on. Um, I just had a couple of uh, small items. I think, like Commissioner Naka, you had the benefit of, you know, probably more of my input than you really wanted during the subcommittee process. So that's that's that. But um, on Monday at council, there was a discussion of, you know, one of the pieces of the parking challenge, and um, this notion of the, you know, um, what's called neighborhood intrusion. Uh, of, of cars being parked in, in neighborhoods adjacent to the business and commercial areas is, is uh, something which is being addressed with a lot of attention and seriousness. So I commend that, that focus. But one of the things that occurs to me that when you go forward in implementing a transportation demand management program, if you were a business, you would know who your employees were. You would know where they were coming from, uh, you know how many cars were in the mix, and you would be able to do some analysis with that data of how to best serve, uh, to match the, the supply of parking with the demand for parking and the time of people arriving and leaving and so forth. And um, because of its potential value for a TDM program, 
uh, and also as far as may have some uh, valid input in terms of the overall vision of the comprehensive plan. Is this a time to think about having a business registry of some sort, which might involve a business license tax, it might be nominal, but some way that you could have systematically a collection of information and data um, about the businesses that we want to be successful, uh, understanding their needs in terms of having employees who need a place to park, just as one, one, one aspect of, of all that. Uh, but that might be something that would be added in the uh, goal B, B5, uh, which um, it occurred to me in the Monday night's council discussion that that could be something that would be useful. <clears throat> um, and uh, I just had a, um, one uh, personal observation on the, uh, the encouragement to, uh, to make sure that Palo Alto is friendly to, to businesses which are non-chain non businesses. And that is it's probably hard for us to recognize what is or is not a chain. Um, you know, if Apple Computer puts their first ever retail store in Palo Alto, and subsequently there are other Apple stores around the world, do we have to evict Apple from University Avenue because it's now a chain? Or um, do we have uh, some issue with, uh, you know, branch banking, you know, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, you know, just to name a few. Um, it seems to me that um, in terms of the implementation of what's otherwise an attractive concept, um, that's um, a challenge that I personally haven't thought through, but I think it's kind of tricky. Um, although it, again, may have a lot of merit. Um, the other um, aspect of um, that suggestion by Commissioner Alcheck and, and the other comments from the commission was that um, I think in terms of the land use element, uh, we have maybe um, underappreciated um, the, um, the optimal extent of, of zoning for ground floor retail. Uh, and that's something that to me uh, would be a, a big, uh, an important, um, um, I guess, uh, objective for the city. And I think that, you know, I have a question that you often have this sort of um, Main Street phenomenon. So it's California Avenue, it's University Avenue, but I think in a number of cities you have uh, vibrant, uh, thriving, you know, profitable retail activity, which is not just on one street, but it's on side streets and it's on a parallel adjacent streets. So that, um, you know, for University Avenue, what about Hamilton and Lytton? For California Avenue, what about Cambridge and, you know, whatever the, the one on the other side is? Sherman. Sherman. Um, and so you have, you know, if you have sort of a rectangular district uh, or other geometric shape <laughs> as opposed to a linear, uh, then some of the issues relating to parking and traffic congestion and gridlock um, and also opportunities uh, maybe for businesses to have more available inventory, possibly at more competitive rents, might open up if you, if you have a more expansive notion of, of the ground floor retail zoning. Um, and perhaps that extends just to, to Bob Moss's uh, insights uh, to what you do with the El Camino Real commercial um, opportunities, which are of great importance to the city. Um, so with that, um, uh, maybe before we do any kind of a second round with the commission, does the staff want to make any comment on what you've what you've heard or any um, any further insights? I, I don't I don't have anything further to add myself on any particular comment other than to say, even if ideas don't actually get officially into the comp plan tonight, you know, on if there's an amendment made to, to the staff recommendation, I think these are all good ideas that we need to put forward for the community to give input on when it does get to the council council level. I know the director and I have recently uh, had been talking about, you know, do how do we want to discuss the uh, formula retail uh, policy like San Francisco has. So those are converse, those are the exact type of conversations we need to have with the community. Um, so this is an important um, uh, element, and it's one of the last uh, elements of the, of the comprehensive plan in draft form that the PTC will be discussing in this format. We've been working on this with the staff now for, for several years, and uh, it looks as though we're 
hitting a milestone, uh, that we just have one more element after business economics, which is the governance element. Hopefully we will see that um, maybe um, sometime next month or ASAP, at which point um, the, the, uh, the work that has been done by staff with input from the PTC will be ready to go to the next step, which will be under the direction of the council. Um, so with the notion that this is the, you know, the, the last chance for the PTC to kind of reflect on the, the draft of the business economics element in its current form, let's have a, have a second round and uh, let, let people uh, provide any further guidance that uh, would be useful. Commissioner Alcheck. Okay, I failed to say this the first time around, but I, I, I do appreciate all the work that's gone into this, and I think the element's very strong. Um, as you know, this is not a required element for, for a general plan or a comprehensive plan. And because our community is so, um, it, the business, the businesses in our community and the retail in our community is so important to the nature of our community, I would argue, or I would propose that um, we don't shy away from this idea that I've raised tonight because it's too complicated to discuss in 25 minutes. I agree, it's very complicated. How do uh, banking facilities factor in? How do grocers factor in that are chains? I agree, it's complicated. But it's, we are not the first community, even in California, to kind of, to, that would be the, we, were, we would not be the first community in California to look into this or to even initiate it. And I think it's well worth our time to discuss this because there are so many elements of this idea that could alleviate some of the fear that our community members have about the future rents and development of this city. I want to sort of add that I like Chipotle, I like P.F. Chang's, I like the Cheesecake Factory, I like Jamba Juice, I like Pizza Hut, I like Subway. I don't think we need more of them. Certainly not at the expense of, what's that restaurant we went to last time we had lunch on California Avenue, that delicious little something cafe, whatever it's called. It ought to be in San Francisco, it's so good. And, and I think we can attract San Francisco restaurant owners to this area to develop interesting offerings. And if they don't have to compete with the likes of Chipotle and Jamba Juice, maybe they will be able to afford the rent. I wanna just sort of suggest that um, this is, again, a very complicated and And I think there's a lot of economics involved. Um, but it's not enough to suggest that chain stores offer us the best value as consumers. There is a qualitative value of local owned businesses. And I would argue Apple, by definition, is a locally owned business. But, you know, there, there's a, they provide a foundation for the web of connections and trust that's essential to a healthy neighborhood. Independent stores are located in hu humanly scaled, pedestrian oriented shopping districts for the most part, as opposed to sprawling shopping centers surrounded by parking. And they create a sense of place and a community identity. They reflect local culture. They give neighborhoods distinct flavor. They're a source of community of pride and they attract, um, and they attract visitors. Chain stores, by contrast, they sap community character. Even the most famous American cities lose their unique appeal when Kmart, Costco, Home Depot, whatever you want, Starbucks, The Gap, they're good stores, but we don't need them to proliferate California Avenue at the expense of the university art shop or whatever, the art store that moved to Redwood City, whatever it is. No, right here on university, this art store is gone. Okay, what's gonna move in? A yoga studio, uh, who knows? But the retail 
I agree with your sentiment, protecting them. How many nail salons do we need? I'm not suggesting that we dictate what goes where. I am suggesting that we sort of take this bird's eye view or we explore the implementation in other cities of this bird's eye view about chains. This notion that who makes the decision on what merchandise is carried in our local stores? Some guy that lives in, in um, Atlanta or somebody that lives two doors down from you? And, and, and if it's the guy that's two doors down from you, well, how much more uh, appealing would that be to the neighborhood surrounding California Avenue when they see a mixed-use development go up where Fry's is now located? Will they be excited if the entire ground floor of whatever development that goes into that Fry's location, whether it's this year when Fry's decides they don't want to be there anymore or in nine years when their lease is up, but when that gets developed and it's got three stories, four stories, five stories, who knows, and housing and a ground floor retail, and that ground floor retail is made up of a you know, unique little uh, Latin bistro as opposed to a Chipotle. I'm, I'm just suggesting that although this is extremely complicated, there's nobody else that's gonna work on it. No other committee is asked with the job of, dis of looking into this stuff. We are, and I think Davis has looked into it, San Francisco's looked into it. Let's look into it. Let's spend a little bit more time on this. Uh, Commissioner Tanaka. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna comment on the comments I've heard so far. So um, first one is live work. Um, while those particular units that uh, were mentioned earlier may not have technically been used as live work, I, I could say that just about every single startup um, has started with some sort of live work circumstance. So. I, I think that's actually something we want to encourage. I think we want to, in general, lower the friction of trying to start businesses in Palo Alto. Not a lot of the startups can't be in Palo Alto anymore because it's, it's actually very hard. So I think, um, think doing things to help enable that is important, uh, which is also why I, I don't really support the idea. A business registry is not a bad idea, but a paid one, I think, is not. So I think, again, whatever we could do to make it easy to start businesses, I think is good, but to put up additional barriers, I think it's, it's already hard enough. So I, I don't think we want to do more. Uh, I do like the idea of you know, supporting more hotels. I think that's also a good thing. Uh, more public facilities on, on Cal Off, I think, are also good. Um, and I also like the concept of retail diversity, although I don't know if we want to necessarily set quotas, but I do, I do support that. We don't want like 50 nails alone on Cal Off. I, I get that, that's, that makes sense. I don't know quite how to do that. That's a very complicated topic. Um, but it's something which we should take up some help. Because I do think this kind of retail diversity actually creates a stronger area. I just don't know how to do it, and I, but I do support that kind of concept. And um, that said, I, um, I, I, I understand where Commissioner Altrick's coming from, and I, in general, like the ideas, but I, I do think that um, it's, uh, you know, I think the consumer should have an ability to choose and to me, that's the greatest good. So I think we should, we should do all we can to support these new, re new innovative concepts to survive and, and, and thrive. Um, but I think, you know, like I think, I think the example of the Apple Store is a good example. That was a, new, new, a very, very new innovative retail concept. And now it's you know, 400 stores or something like that. And, um, you know, it's, I think, I'm not sure it started here in Palto, but it was, it did, okay. So, um, so yeah, so we have we have we have a couple now. So I think um, I think that's what we should be doing versus saying, oh, now that you're successful, you're too good for us. I, I don't I don't, think, I don't think that's the right right way of doing things. But I do like I do understand where you're coming from, and uh, in general, it sounds good. But I I don't think putting a restriction on a chains is the right way of doing it. Thanks, Commissioner King. Uh, let's see. So re regarding the motion that we have uh, um, at hand, I would propose that if, if, as I believe Arthur's intent, Commissioner Keller's intent is, that it's to amend that, I propose that we do use the Keller method that we used a couple months ago, which is that any changes you would like made to this before we approve it um, be uh, offered as a amendment, which I will... Um, uh, deem hostile, and then we can 
vote on them as a group uh, for inclusion into the motion? Uh, you know, I was actually contemplating that um, based on the discussion that we're hearing so far, we're not actually hearing uh, proposals for specific changes, but we're offering sort of general uh, comments uh, and clarifying questions to staff um, that um, that we sort of vote on this sort of up or down in its current form. So I'm, I'm not looking for a straw poll process here as we had, uh, you know, um, experimented with in the past. Um, I, I'm fine with that. And okay. I think that any commissioner has the right to request an amendment. And so if they... So if there's a, if there's a substitute motion to proceed that way, we will deal with it. <laughs> okay, that's great. And then, so then my one comment though is, I don't, and I don't know, this is a, you know, obviously a long-term document. The one thing I don't see in here, <clears throat> and I'm not sure if it's appropriate, is uh, any discussion of how we might address um, a potential long-term decline in retail, local retail, in that certainly we're all, there will always be restaurants, dry cleaners, things that people need to get to physically, they have some physical exchange. But if Amazon, Google have their way, and certainly if you look at the trends, I, I don't know, I haven't seen the numbers, but I suspect that probably, what, 20 to 40% of, of, of commerce, of stuff, is now being done online. Uh, rather than at a local re that, that had been done at a local retail level, so I don't know if uh, how we might include in this a plan for how do we adapt if that trend continues. So, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Keller. Um, so I'd like to make a substitute motion, and the substitute motion is that uh, we recommend. Um, that the Planning Transportation Commission review and comment on the draft business and economics element vision statement, goals, policies, and programs, and support their inclusion in the comprehensive plan uh, with the uh, series of amendments to be decided by straw poll among the members of the commission so we can give definitive input to staff. Uh, Seeing no second. Uh, I suggest. Uh, Commissioner Alcheck. Um, I just want to point a clarification here. There, there was, you sort of have a two, I, I recall two sort of issues you took with the document specifically. One of them being an addition to the vision statement, and the second was something less. Um, Specific. I think people. I think people. I think people had a, a variety of comments. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, for example, there was a comment about a business registry. There was a comment about um, your idea of an appropriate way of doing the uh, uh, of of studying the issue of business diversity. There were a few other comments that some of which there's support for. And I think that just as we did with the California Avenue concept plan, if we had consensus on the commission, we would provide better input to staff. And rather than our inputs not being tracked and essentially not having a way to be got, gotten to the document, I prefer that the document be edited by staff based on our definitive input. And that's why I'm making my motion. My, my concern is that the last time we did this, it just sort of devolved into a very lengthy process. And one, my hope last time was that people would use their five minutes to sort of opine on the various comments made if they had an issue with them. So for example, I think Commissioner Tanaka has made it clear to the staff that he doesn't necessarily share his view on this sort of limitation on chain stores. So if, for example, we instructed staff to go back to the drawing board and come back to it. And if that was the case in this particular instance, to go back to the drawing board and come back to us, they would have some sense of his opinion on my comments. I just, the last time we did this, it became a very lengthy process. And so I'm concerned that it will do that again. Uh, so there's a motion. Um, it has not been seconded. And what I would uh, just note is that um, I'd like to give Vice Chair Keller uh, ample time to reflect fully in your comments uh, any suggestions that would be taken uh, either by staff or by council with respect to this, uh, this draft element. 
Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to ask staff a question. And based on the five comments, five commissioners commenting, um, do you think you have a clear idea on where things stand? And do you think that um, you will be modifying the document? Or where will our comments go? Do they go into the ether and, and whoever wants to read our minutes can, can use them? Or will, they, or will you be able to get, use them and definitively to amend the document to move forward with that? So we won't amend the document unless there's a motion to amend staff recommendation as the document stands right now. So if there was a motion to say, you know, add explore, uh, you know, explore uh, options for having a, uh, developing a business registry, and three of the five commissioners up there said, yes, we want to see that incorporated, then we don't incorporate this into, into the actual draft plan that becomes the basis for council and public outreach discussion. Now, other comments that are out there, you know, we're going to have additional opportunities to discuss this, so people will be able to see the Planning Commission uh, minutes, you know, and other things, other things will be discussed. But the, in terms of what the official document is that becomes the basis for discussion, it will, text changes will only be made if an actual amendment is made to the motion to include those. Okay, thank you. Then, then I will go along with the suggestion of the maker of the motion and propose some amendments which we could either accept by the maker and, and seconder or vote on accordingly. So uh, the first suggestion um, is that we add um, a, I'm not sure if it's a policy or program, but we add an element um, that uh, in create, a, a, I guess a policy, we had a policy to have a study um, of uh, how to promote retail diversity um, by considering such things as chain stores, uh, the, pro proliferation, the, the proliferation of restaurants and nail salons, and the appropriate balance of local and um, a, a, of local retail. Can I second that motion? Well, no, it's the maker and the Sorry. seconder. So I'm sorry, but I'm unclear as to the process. So I, we now have a motion on the table. And I made a formal amendment to the motion. That so the, it's, that a, it's a request for a friendly amendment. Okay. Rather does than a friendly a amendment need a second? No, it needs to be accepted by the maker of the motion and accepted by the seconder of the motion, or it becomes uh, a substitute motion. <laughs> no, it becomes an amendment that's unfriendly, which gets voted on. Okay. Okay, so the unfriendly amendment gets voted on. Okay, then I reject your suggestion, your amendment. Okay, then I make it as a formal amendment, which I believe needs a second. Okay, second. okay uh, so there's um, moved and seconded. I don't think there needs to be any discussion. Uh, for clarification, Arthur, you want to just restate what your motion for is? Yes, what I said is that uh, we have a policy to have a study of uh, promoting retail diversity by considering such things as the mix of retail, of local uh, and chain stores, locally owned or chain stores, uh, and the mix of things like restaurants and nail salons, um, and that this, this be um, incorporated in the uh, business and economics element. Okay. Um, do you want to speak to your second? Briefly. <laughs> I just, again, I want to encourage us to include this because it's, a, it's our opportunity to, to really do the, the legwork and to encourage the legwork that maybe can happen that will create better vitality here. This is not suggesting these the codes are going to get passed. It's suggesting that we empower staff to look into this as a priority with no specific um, solution identified. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? So it uh, passes the amendment to the motion, passes uh, four to one with Chair Michael uh, voting no. Um, thank you. So the second item um, is that uh, we I think it's a I think it's a program rather than a policy somewhere uh, that we encourage the location of city facilities near California Avenue uh, as a way of promoting business development on California Avenue or thriving businesses on California Avenue. 
you know, nearby, not necessarily on California, but in, in, that, in that vicinity. So if I can interject a clarifying question. Um, we have, um, um, on February 12th, we'll be considering the CalAB concept plan. Would this concept, or this, this suggestion be more appropriate in the CalAB concept plan than the business and economics element? Um, perhaps, but I'm not sure we want to make more amendments to the CalAV concept plan, and it's more really thought of as a business environment than a, than a, a CalAV issue. And there already is there, there already is, I believe, in the in the California Avenue concept plan, the idea of the idea of of locating city facilities there, and so this would basically cross-reference that in the business and economic element. So you're proposing this to go into goal under B2, business centers, downtown and California Avenue? Um, yes, that, yes, that's probably a good place. Okay. Uh, and there was a second. Commissioner Snodka, do you want to speak to your second? Well, actually, I didn't second it, but. Oh, who seconded it? Did anybody second it? <laughs> Just yes or no. Okay, this fails for lack of a second. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next thing um, is in B6.6, .6, adding a, um, go ahead. Okay. Commissioner Tanaka. So in principle, I, I like the idea. The only reason, the only issue I have though is that this is more of a government thing, right, than a business and economics. So I, that's the only, that's the issue why I, I think, I'm not sure it belongs in this element. It okay. probably belongs somewhere. Okay. Okay, that's fair. Uh, I, I think that there is support for this, but it's not clear where it belongs. So uh, I think that that's what I, I hear. Uh, in 6.6, .6, uh, which is about hotels, I believe, um, I suggest adding reference uh, to a hotel, uh, to, to the need for hotels near the uh, Stanford Research Park. Is this a friendly amendment or a? It's an unfriendly amendment. Okay. Um, motion made and seconded. Um, I think it's relatively clear. Um, all in favor? All opposed? Uh, so it fails. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I think that the um, la uh, last amendment I'd like to make uh, offer is uh, to uh, create. Um, and I think this, I think this is a policy. Uh, create, and I'm not sure where it goes, but it create a policy pr uh, promoting the creation of a business registry to gather census data on businesses, including um, employees and transportation data. And this would go in B5. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> uh, I will actually second that. Um, is, is it a... It is unfriendly. Yes. Unfri okay, so uh, I think that's re relatively clear. Uh, all in favor of um, inserting a policy into goal B5 regarding a business registry? Aye. Um, all opposed? So that passes four to one with Commissioner Tanaka saying no. Uh, thank you. Um, so I thought that that's the end of the amendments that I'd like to offer. I'll just make one comment in, in terms of uh, something that was said, uh, which there was a comment made, I forget who said this, about uh, customers somehow deciding where business, what businesses go or, or stay. And I don't think customers decide what businesses stay what businesses go, what businesses are, are put in there. It's landlords who decide. And landlords decide whether businesses stay, even thriving ones, are essentially kicked out by uh, increasing rents or 60-day notices to quit, such as what happened to Cho's um, and what happened to Didham's. Their rent went up dramatically. Um, even thriving businesses. So I, 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 I disagree with the notion that, that the, the, the customers decide. The customers can sort of hasten that process by not shopping somewhere. Uh, but essentially, the economics are driven by landlords. Thank you. So with that, um, we've got a motion uh, by Commissioner King, seconded by Commissioner Tanaka, with certain amendments that we've just um, dealt with. Um, uh, is it clear what we're voting on? 
Uh, all in favor of, uh, of this motion? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Um, so uh, good work. Uh, Commissioner King? Um, I would just like to note regarding the concern that using that process, the uh, unfriendly amendment process would be, would take a long time. That took about 11 minutes. So just for future reference. I, I, and I thank Arthur for introducing, or Commissioner Keller for introducing that method uh, at our previous meeting. Thanks. Uh, so it's a very collegial and, and, uh, and thoughtful group tonight. And, and <laughs> so um, with that, um, we've uh, dealt with, we're going to close the public hearing uh, and move to the next uh, item, which is approval of minutes from our meetings of November 13th and December 11th of 2013, which commissioners received electronically. Um, uh, so moved with amendments. Uh, is there a second? second. Uh, all in favor? It's unanimous. Um, and uh, we've had the director's report. Um, this is a time for any other commission and staff announcements, updates, reports, and comments. Uh, Vice-Chair Keller. Um, yes, uh, the, uh, besides the mention of the uh, residential preferential parking, I think that's what P RPP stands for now, uh, that was mentioned by the uh, director. Uh, there was also uh, the approval uh, by the Council of the um, Housing Density Bonus Law uh, with amendments. Uh, the amendments were to tighten uh, the square footage and other uh, the um, um, allowances. And in particular, one major amendment that was made uh, was to uh, remove the catch-all that 100% uh, 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 affordable housing projects could essentially have additional um, some some more uh, uh, concessions, and that was removed by council uh, at the request of uh, quite a number of the members of the public. Um, I think that that was was there anything else on the agenda? Uh, the, on there was the, ha the some of the amendments related to the housing element. Yeah. I, uh, oh yeah. So the housing element, uh, we ha we uh, basically uh, the housing element we pretty much went through without. I don't remember there was any particular changes. The the, the one major one that there was a lot of low hanging fruit type changes that were made. The most there was a motion made that in the housing inventory sites, one of the big major changes was going up from 15 units an acre to or yeah 15 uh, mm -hmm. dwelling units an acre to 20 dwelling units an acre for home for sites that were in the CS zone that were identified within the housing inventory. There was a motion made to reduce the FAR, although there will be a more units allowed uh, on those sites, to reduce the overall FAR on that site so that you don't see as much massing impacts and things along those lines. Um, which is interesting, particularly since uh, they get a little bonus FAR, so that sort of under, uh, uh, counteracts that in an interesting way. Um, I think that was basically. I think that was basically the uh, oh, things. Thank you. That was it. Yeah. Any other announcements? Um, oh, we had a um, subcommittee meeting uh, this afternoon um, regarding the California Avenue area concept plan, which will be coming back to the, uh, the commission on February twelfth. Um, so um, again, this is um, um, in the the home stretch of the work that the PTC as a commission and with subcommittees has been doing with staff to help develop drafts of the different um, uh, amendments to the comprehensive plan, which will be shortly forwarded to council and then with uh, seeking community input, um, a process that may take up to two years. So it's uh, certainly gonna be uh, open for uh, anybody and everybody who's a stakeholder and, and pays attention to, to have their say and add value. Um, so I think that's it uh, for this evening. Um, meeting adjourned at uh, 7.50, which may be a record. <laughs> <laughs>